Karate. Als je niet sterk is, nee, moet je slim wees. Wakker en rat. Perfecte balans. Blitzige optreden om je tegenstander onverhoeds te betrappen. Vinnig dunk. Uit oerlei. Onschadelijk maakt voordat je leven in gevaar gesteld wordt. Ja. Stan Schmidt is a crack exponent of karate and demonstrate how defense is switched to attack. Die genietsige aanvaller wordt op kop gegrijpt met de knie gepompt en hardhandig grond te gebruiken. It's from the east, it's called Kihon. Looks good and groovy, but does it make sense? It's the basics, man, of self-defense. Why fight? It's peace I want, not death. Then fight for peace, don't waste your breath. Kihon is the way we do prepare to learn a Japanese art named Karate. It's a fighting art, as I've said, with fists and feet and arms and head. Come blows and blocks from those first three, but the head is used for psychology. The way of the empty hand is good, but seldom clearly understood. If you wish to ride on this road to gain, the password friend is train man train. I see you moving from left to right. Yes, I'm going through a formal imaginary fight. No opponents around you do I see. Well, I'm doing a kata, and my opponent is me. Your hardest fight from life's beginning to end is the fight against yourself, my friend. We talk about the Shogun era, it's all about hierarchy. It's all about honor, courtesy, respect. And if you get it wrong, and someone loses face, you can lose your head. But here, in modern day times, we can keep our head. It's most important to keep the right etiquette, courtesy and respect when training in martial arts. So remember, courtesy starts with a bow. Did you ever think of where karate would take you? Never, no. I was just in it, like immersed in it and loving, even loved the blisters I was getting on my feet by the, end oh, of the first the week. And yeah, because a lot of up time, down, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, bruises on the arms because from the blocking, etc. It didn't deter you. On the face. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever we were, he was training, and um, it was just part of what we we knew as what a family. We learned, yeah. Actually, remember he used to get us to sit on his legs to do the stretching and hold them yes. up, and we, he, so he involved us in his training. Even yes. when we were in his training, we were little, you know. Yeah, yeah. They were trained like the sandbags. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the legs down. Yeah, they have to stand there, cat stand, yeah. <laughs> give us a yeah. Yeah. good stretch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You were at a, a very special time and place when. Uh, karate is really developing, and all of the, the legends that came up there, that from the Inodas, uh, uh, Kenazawas, and so all in your train, training environment, really. Yes, yeah. yes. So it must be very special. Every single a one. Very, of them. Yes. A really unique time. Yeah, very much so. I, I, I only today appreciate that. I, I loved it then, but now I appreciate it. And uh, bless, bless them all, those who are there still and those who are gone. Quite a few of them are gone. The Inoweda, yeah. he died a few years ago, and Kase since they died a few years ago. And Kasi was just an amazing, like a dynamo of a man. Well, they usually, he usually came back talking about um, a particular person that he had fight, um, very difficult experiences fighting different people um, and things he experienced with the Japanese people, good things as well. Yeah. Um, Yes, I think I think the fighting was mostly the the difficult things in Japan, that learning how to cope with different fighters. What was the main emphasis in the training in Japan in those days? Was it the kihon, the basic practice, the conditioning, or the card of the spine? Was it all of that? It was all of that, but the first one that you said, basics over and over again, just repeating them. What they called honing the sword, put it in water. Sorry, first heat it, put it in water, and mold it again. You know that kind of stuff. How, how the, the basics were everything. Mm. Kicks, kicking, punching, striking, blocking. Up and down, up and down, repetition after repetition. So how did you really cope? You know, your father was traveling a lot, going to Japan. How did you feel when he was away? We got used to it, I think. We, we you know, because he was, when he was he home, went away often, so yeah. Yeah, we, did, we got very used to it. I think we had a very um, busy house. So, well, I don't know, when we lived in the big house, they, they're a lot older than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> our house was constantly filled with people. So, we didn't notice a big void, so to speak. Yes. And we're just used to the fact that that's where they learned things. They went overseas, my mom and dad, both all the time. Yes. So, we found that quite exciting, actually, that they went away and came back with presents and presents. information. <laughs> you know? Presents, they came back with goodies for yes. you. Yes, always came back with presents. Once we started having the children, I didn't travel as much um, until they were older, but standard, he, he traveled. 
and uh, then eventually we did get an opportunity to travel with them, which we did do quite a bit of. It obviously would have taken some sacrifices on the home front to be able to do that, and obviously a support system to do. What sort of sacrifices did you make to, to continue I, that training? I never saw them as sacrifices, but through all the pressure they were needed. So the first one was even Kase Sensei, when he was there on his first visit, there was Kase mm. Sensei, Kanazawa Sensei, and Oweda Sensei, and Shurai Sensei. The four, wow. yeah. they were the big four, and they arrived in South Africa around 65, 66, I can't quite remember. And then Kase said to me, Mr. Stan, please, leave, you go full time, and then, then you become chief instructor. And then you visit Japan, you spread karate in South Africa. Yeah. Yes, but we also had a lot of Japanese visitors that came. Yeah, yeah, so that was very interesting. One of the interesting things was the breakfast that Sensei Inoueda taught us to make, which was hot rice yes. with egg, raw egg beaten up into the rice and cheese and soya sauce. Really? Mm. Wow. And we, and we, we ate that for breakfast religiously. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we enjoyed having the Japanese there. It was very, very different. Friendly, lovely, yeah. very different. Very yeah. lovely people. Yeah. Tia went to go live with one of the Japanese instructors. Yes, when I was 11, I went for five weeks and stayed in one of their homes with them. Mm. Just by, you know, I flew with my dad, but yeah. I stayed with him on, you know, on my own and actually learned a lot about the Japanese culture and just really a good experience. It was amazing. They're wonderful people. So I had more time. And I created what we called the early birds that was short, shortly after getting back from my first trip to Japan. So what are the early birds then? Early so birds, the idea was that an early bird catches the worm. It was a saying at school that I learned and uh, yeah. the worm being uh, and, you know, your, uh, something that feeds you and that is going to sustain you and make you strong. And that worm was just very hard training. Within those days, it was the people who were aspiring to get black belt. They weren't, they weren't all black belts around. Oh. I wasn't even one after I came back, I was just a brown belt. And uh, we all trained so hard that uh, we trained six days a week. At six in the morning, we'd arrive, um, two of the days were at my house on the lawn with a smaller group, and the other days were at uh, the Orange Grove, what we call the Orange Grove Dojo. Yeah. 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 Yeah.